but want to revisit the comments that you made with me a couple of weeks ago, comments that, at least on Twitter, went viral. We mentioned more than 10 million views. I think we're up to 10 and a half million right now. I'd like to rewatch part of that exchange, Chamath, and then I want to react to it on the other side. Just, you keep saying propping up zombie companies. Are, are, you, are you arguing to let airlines, for example, fail? Yes. Why? I mean, how, how does that make sense in the broader scheme of, of the economy? Because it's not, because when you look at what it means, this is why I'm saying, like, this is a lie that's been purported by Wall Street. When a company fails, it does not fire their employees. It goes through a packaged bankruptcy. Right. If anything, what happens is the people who have the pensions inside those companies, the employees of these companies end up owning more of the company. The people that get wiped out are the speculators that own the unsecured tranches of debt or the folks that own the equity. And by the way, those are the rules of the game. That's right, because these are the people that purport to be the most sophisticated investors in the world. They deserve to get wiped out. But the employees don't get wiped out. The pensions don't typically get wiped out. Why does anybody, I just don't understand, why does anybody deserve, using your word, to get wiped out from a, a, a crisis created like, like this? How, how does anybody is, deserve to get wiped don't. out? Well, but, but, but just be clear, like, who are we talking about? We're talking about a hedge fund that serves a bunch of billionaire family offices? Who cares? Let them get wiped out. Who cares? They don't get the summer in the Hamptons? Who cares? All right, so that was a couple of weeks ago, and there's a lot in there, and I want to go through uh, some of it. But you use, you know, statements like the, the lie pur um, purported by, by Wall Street. Uh, you talk about the speculators, and you go after hedge funds. But here you are, Chamath, on a day where you're doing an IPO at the New York Stock Exchange, raising hundreds of millions of dollars, essentially selling this IPO and marketing it to the very speculators that you rail against. And I'm wondering how you can square how you square that on a day like today, and this is the perfect day to have that conversation. Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is that's not true. Um, you know, there are uh, all kinds of different kinds of hedge funds and investment vehicles. And what I will tell you is that a lot of my time uh, in IPO A and again in IPO C was uh, curating the list of investors that, you know, I would work with. And, um, when I look at the list of people that uh, I essentially allowed into the deal at the, at the amounts that they did, these are because these are folks that have proven to be long dated, thoughtful people who can take risk, but understand businesses. Look, um, let's shift the topic for one second and we can come back to this. What I want to talk about is uh, why I made the comments that I did and why it touched such a nerve. Um, there is an interesting fact, Scott, that you should know, which is that since 2009, uh, the 500 companies in the S&P 500, so these are the 500 best companies in the world, they bought back $7 trillion of stock and or issued dividends, okay? That, that turned out to be 90, more than 90 cents of every single dollar of profit that they made over the last 11-plus uh, years. Um, the federal government, as well as the Fed, between monetary and fiscal stimulus combined, have essentially transferred around seven trillion dollars now back to those said companies as well as you know companies slightly smaller than them um, and i think why i was frustrated is that i just think that that kind of behavior makes no sense and instead of being punished it has been rewarded and if you ask me why here's how i would explain it the job of a ceo especially of a public for-profit company is to be a fabulous allocator of resources. And there are only two kinds of resources that a CEO controls that matter. The first is human capital, right? The people that work inside of your company and the ideas that they have and the products that they make. And the second is financial capital, the money that you take to invest in great ideas, to protect for the future, to prepare for whether it's a pandemic or a shock or a recession or a competitor. And the best capital allocators become the best CEOs. So if you take a company like Facebook or Google, they're a very capital asset light business. So a lot of their skill is in picking great people. So take Zuck. He picked Sheryl Zandberg. He picked me. He put us in positions to build that business. He's a fabulous human capital allocator. On the other end of the spectrum, take Buffett. 
He has no human capital inside of Berkshire. It's all financial capital, but he's a fabulous capital allocator. Or you take Jeff Bezos, a case in the middle, where he has both of those two things. In all cases, great CEOs are great allocators of capital. When you do things like buybacks and dividends, what you are essentially saying is you are throwing your hands up in the air and declaring to the world, I do not know what to do with this money. And instead of deciding to save that money, to try to do M&A, to try to invest in R&D, to pay your employees more, these people have given it back in an open market purchase. Now, let's look at that for a second. Why is that a stupid idea? Well, it's a stupid idea for two reasons. The first is that it disproportionately only benefits the executives and the CEO and the board, because those are the ones that disproportionately get most of the stock inside of a company. And it disproportionately benefits those specific hedge funds that were agitating for that behavior and activity, who take a short-term position and allow themselves to participate in short-term profits. And now what happens is the people that believe least in the company, i.e. the people that sell the stock, get rewarded. And then who's left holding the bag? The people that uh, believe in the business. Let's take a specific example, Scott, and you can see how bad this is. IBM, over the last you know, decade, has spent $140 billion on buybacks. This is a company with a $100 billion market cap. The last CEO found a way to oversee 24 consecutive orders of revenue decline, and for that, was still able to compensate herself $100 million of stock-based comp. Now, you look at all of this kind of behavior and you can say, how is this supported? Why aren't all these companies trying to figure out how to be more resilient? And it turns out that the incentives were so skewed away from being resilient it was only focused on short-term profiteering for the sake of the managerial class it, and the hedge funds that, around that, them that's a, that's and nobody a, else. 